Okay, well, good morning. It's actually slightly more civilised time today re relative to yesterday here, and uh, good afternoon to you. It's uh, early morning here. Um, sun's not out yet. It's still dark. It's winter, of course. Uh, what I want to talk about today is uh, Thurwell's Law, but, but more broadly, I think uh, Randy wanted me to talk about the, the, the way in which the external economy um, fits into modern monetary theory. And what I would say is that this is one of the areas that uh, over the last you know, 27 years or something that we've been working together in what we now call MMT um, that has attracted the most significant criticism. Uh, most people of all persuasions, ideological persuasions, can get their heads around eventually that the government has no financial constraint, but, but they still struggle with the external economy. And I'll, I'll, I think that that's the, the mainstream economists struggle with everything, so it never surprises me that they can't get things. But um, t Randy might disagree with me, but this is, an this is an area today that I'm talking about, which is a major rift between us and post-Keynesian economists. Um, and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more in a second. Um, and, and part of the story is that we, we really have to differentiate constraints on, on policy. So I, I divide uh, real resource constraints, as I mentioned yesterday, financial constraints and political constraints. And when you're talking about Thurwell's law and balanced payments, uh, constrained growth theory, it really um, resolves to an understanding that really they're just talking about political constraints. Uh, but I'll and I'll articulate why I think that. Uh, and I think that uh, many post Keynesians and all mainstream economists always conflate those three types of constraints and that's why they come up with erroneous conclusions. Uh, the, other, the other thing that I'd say is that, you know, I mentioned it yesterday and everybody knows that in August 71 there was a major change in the structure of the global monetary system. It took another four odd years until the Jamaica Accords to fully be resolved and manifest, but the abandonment of a fixed exchange rate system for most nations changed the, the constraints facing government fundamentally. And uh, uh, the external economy... Uh, no longer became the constraint that it was on domestic policy because the central bank was freed from uh, managing uh, the currency in the system uh, in order to stabilise the exchange rate at its agreed parity within the Bretton Woods system. And fiscal policy then had to play a, a certain role to make sure it didn't violate what the central bank was doing. And so you had what we called sort of stop, grow, stop, go, growth patterns where the economy would grow a bit, imports would rise, uh, uh, the, the trade account would go into increased deficit for many countries. Uh, the exchange rate would start to feel downward pressure. The central bank would have to hike interest rates and also engage in foreign exchange interventions by buying its own currency with its limited supply of foreign exchange. And the government would have to go, the fiscal policy would have to go into reverse as well. And you ended up with a situation where, where nations with chronic current account deficit propensities would be always on the brink of recession. There was a deflationary bias always in those countries because of the, their membership of the system. And that obviously then became politically unacceptable. And so you had... You know, the system broke down because of that, in mostly. And um, 
once that that system collapsed, uh, governments were free. Their domestic policy ambitions were much freer. Now, what mainstream economists and most post Keynesians and Randy might take me up and say, well, that's not true, but I think it is true. Most post-Keynesians have still hung on to the idea that the constraints from the fixed exchange rate system, the bias towards speculative short selling, uh, the problems of foreign exchange holdings within the central bank, and those type of uh, problems that uh, beguiled the fixed exchange rate system, they carried over to the ex uh, flexible exchange rate system. And that uh, wa it, while the government mightn't have a financial constraint in, in the sense that it issues its own currency, it still has a balance of payments constraint and that's the limiting factor. And, and then if... Uh, uh, that means that it's not, if, if that holds, well, then that means it's not true to say that the government isn't, uh, isn't ultimately financially constrained. Now, a lot of people have asked me over my journey, you know, well, are you a post-Keynesian economist, Bill? And I always say no. They say, are you a heterodox economist? I say no. And, you know, from an early age, I was rather rather uh, dissuaded against heterodoxy and post-Keynesian e economics because of the way the Cambridge England lot treated Marx, particularly Joan Robinson, uh, but it became very entrenched in the as a young student in the 1970s for two reasons. One reason was the, the acceptance uh, James O'Connor's book, Fiscal Crisis of the State, it was a, the acceptance of uh, the idea that the, with increased globalisation, uh, the government was financially constrained uh, and uh, couldn't run deficits uh, unless the foreign exchange markets were, were in acceptance of them, and typically they weren't apparently. And so the, there was a, 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 a bias in, among progressive economists towards fiscal conservatism. Now, they would hedge it and say they're doves and you can have a bit of a deficit here and then it's got to be paid back and all of that stuff that you're probably familiar with. But it was fiscal conservatism. It was just a sort of sound finance light approach. And, you know, I was understanding things by the sort of late 70s and I rejected that outright. And I thought that, and, and the, 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 the other part of that story is that the, uh, a lot of when I was in my formative academic years, the uh, post-Keynesians were being diverted into all sorts of identity type studies and methodology and, and critical realism and all of these things, which look, don't get me wrong, they're interesting intellectual inquiries. But I felt, and I mentioned it yesterday, that we, we as, as, as antagonists to the mainstream, I felt that we should be in the main contest. And the main contest every day in the headlines is macroeconomics. And so once you're surrendering to the, 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 principle, the principles that the mainstream were pushing to render the ability of governments to use fiscal policy, once you surrender to those principles, well, then you've lost the contest. And it doesn't matter how smart you are talking about hermeneutics and critical realism and abstract debates about this and that, uh, we've lost the contest. And I think that's that adoption of that type of uh, conservatism in the 70s really let us down. But the other up thing that really bugged me, especially because I obviously come from a small open economy, which has virtually no industrial base, it's a primary commodity exporter, agricultural and minerals. The other element of the surrender was the uh, adoption of this notion of balance of payments, constrained growth. This is Thurwell's approach. 
But Thurwell wasn't the first one to really, he just articulated in a different way. And this is this notion that, that they're Keynesians in the sense that they believe there can be an aggregate demand constraint, but the source of that constraint can never be a domestic spending. It's, it's export growth. And uh, uh, a nation's growth was limited accordingly by exports. And as a consequence, fiscal policy was constrained by the export potential of the economy. And, uh, you know, this, led, this has led to an obsession with the, the so-called power of international currency markets and uh, a fear of them, a paranoia of them, a pathological paranoia. And also this, you know, fed in and reinforced the whole shift in the IMF. Once, once Bretton Woods collapsed, the IMF had no role. Its, its, its theoretical, its, its function, its definition lapsed because, you know, it was no longer uh, embedded within a fixed exchange rate system. But it reinvented itself as a sort of neoliberal attack dog. And um, uh, it's this export growth mania, which has ravaged societies, communities and environments in the poorest countries of the world, that's all part of this balance of payments, constrained growth theory. And, and uh, the post-Keynesians bought into it all and propagated it and still propagate it today. Now, let's have a look at uh, this diagram. I hope you can see that. Uh, the top left-hand corner, you'll, you'll be familiar with the summary sectoral balances, which is just an accounting identity. And it only has, it's, it's overused, I think, by in, within MMT, but, it's, but it's, it's an important vehicle, pedagogical vehicle, for explaining how income shifts change financial balances, the stock flows. And uh, uh, it's important summary measure to help us understand how you know, national income shifts do that and what are the implications of those shifts. Um, so that's CAB's is current account balance, G minus T is the fiscal balance, and S minus T is X minus I is the uh, private domestic sector balance, a measure of their balance between spending and income. So if we start from, for example, and, and this diagram, you can see we've got le left of the y-axis is an external deficit, uh, right is an external surplus, above the line is uh, the x-axis is fiscal surplus, below the x-axis fiscal deficit. So if we start interrogating some of these uh, areas in the diagram, look at this point B, uh, then B must be is a fiscal deficit and an external surplus. And so according to the accounting structures, whatever causal mechanisms of, are in play in terms of income shifts, B must be a, uh, a position where the private domestic uh, sector is uh, net saving. Now, note I say net saving. It's not saving because households save, but the overall sector can net save. It's a different, they're, they're two comp uh, concepts of saving. And so all points between, say, B and C, going along here, must be savings greater than investment. And all points between A and D must be points where savings is less than investment. Now, the implications for this is that that whole area that I've got defined here, which is the whole area, uh, is available for a currency issuing government. It can allow fiscal policy, whatever the private sector spending and external sector spending and saving decisions are, the, the currency issuer can allow its uh, fiscal situation to adjust to meet its functional aspirations like full employment. Uh, that's without question. 
And that's the sense in which MMT says that the government is not financially constrained, it's real resource constrained only, and, and it can allow, the fiscal deficit is not a, it is just something it should allow to uh, float up and down depending upon the decisions of the, of the private domestic sector. And I, I'm often, when I'm giving presentations, particularly to business groups, and they start raving on about, oh, the deficit's too large, I say, well, you can fix that. And they stare at me like as if I'm a man from Mars. And I say, just invest more, build more capital, build more productive capacity, employ more workers, the deficit will disappear or go down. The, the other point to note is that, well, what are the limits on the private domestic sector? Well, the limits are that uh, you, you, they're defined by that blue space. Now, A, B, C, A, B, C. The, the, the limits are that the private domestic sector can't really sustain permanent and increasing deficits which means that it's, they must be below the 45 degree line because anywhere on the 45 degree line is a private sector balance and you can just work that out logically and you can start from the origin and you can see that if that's an external balance and a fiscal balance, it must also be according to this, a, a, a private domestic balance and so on and so forth. So now there are nuances here. And some countries, like Australia, for example, can run private domestic balances on a relatively continuous basis if, if, because we're a capital importer. And uh, so if, if the investment is actually generating uh, export revenue uh, after it becomes productive, well, then uh, it's possible to run a private domestic sector deficit on a more or less ongoing basis. The only problem is that it makes the private sector, uh, domestic sector very vulnerable and that vulnerability, vulnerable to changes in domestic costs, uh, inflation rates and exchange rates. And, and so it, it can lead to crisis. So the safe, sustainable position is defined by, by that, blue triangle and the other thing the other thing we could add in there is if you live in the euro zone the 19 member states then imposing a fiscal rule dramatically limits the sustainable space and that's that gray triangle there uh, you you dramatically reduce the options that a government has in that in that context all right So that's a framework for understanding these things uh, from an MMT perspective. Now, what the post-Keynesians who propagate balance of payments constrained growth theory and Thurwell's law say is that, no, that's not, sent, that's not appropriate, uh, uh, that fiscal deficits are much more constrained by that and they have to basically satisfy cu uh, current current trade in actual fact, trade balances. And any time you get out of sync with a trade balance, the, the fiscal policy will be too, too expansionary. Okay. Um, and, and I think, as I said earlier in the introduction, that, that holding on to that view has really held progressive economics back. Uh, and it's really provided us with... Uh, a defensive position in which to engage in political advocacy, for example, if you, if you, I don't do that, I'm an academic, but we obviously uh, provide information for activists and et cetera. And we've really let the progressive side down or post Keynesians have in my view. And what balance of payments constrained growth theory comes down to is really a belief that the global financial markets can overpower a currency issuing government. Now, I don't know if you follow the bond markets as closely as I do, and particularly in Japan, where I'm sort of very 
I follow that very closely. But there's a real struggle going on at the moment between the balance of pa- uh, Japan, uh, uh, Bank of Japan and uh, the, some of the big global hedge funds. And these hedge funds, you know, these are probably people in their 20s or 30s who think they know everything. And uh, they're, taking, they're, they're, they're going to try to drive the Bank of Japan to follow the Federal Reserve. And it'll be very interesting to see what happens. But the Bank of Japan, if it holds its line, will kill those, kill those investments. Uh, and, and one of the things that MMT allows us to be liberated from, in my view, is the idea that these global amorphous financial markets are all powerful and we have to uh, lay down and uh, satisfy their desires, which are never particularly in line with national interest anyway, uh, because they will kill the currency. And so the, 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 the mechanisms in which balance of payments constrained growth theory work are through this fears about uh, currency crises, about uh, uh, importing inflation via the exchange rate depreciation, about bond market sell-offs and, uh, and more, serious, uh, more seriously from my perspective, as in it's slightly more credible, it, it are notions of deindustrialization. And I think that we can talk about that in a minute, but that that's, tends to be a separate discussion from these financial discussions. Now, you can trace all of this back to Hicks in 1950 and then Caldor, Nicky Caldor. And Caldor, as I said, was a Keynesian, and uh, he therefore believed that demand could constrain, he wasn't believing in Say's law or anything, that uh, demand could constrain growth, but he said it wasn't domestic demand, it was uh, export demand. And for, for Caldor, the only, <clears throat> the only exogenous revenue that a nation received was, ex- was exports. All other sources of expenditure, so consumption, investment and government spending were endogenous. And moreover, the, and so therefore the leakages, the tax, tax leakages, for example, were and import leakages and saving leakages were endogenous, driven by the exogenous export demand, and that uh, he also believed that governments could only spend up to the limit of their taxes. Uh, If they did more than that, there'd be a a debt crisis. And so government spending is endogenously connected to endogenous tax revenue, which is then connected to the export crisis exogenous export growth. Now, you know, imagine, imagine when I read all that stuff, I just sort of thought, well, God, you know, these are meant to be the radicals, you know, the, the antagonists of mainstream, and they're coming out with this sort of stuff. And, and the dynamic, of course, is that you get an export boost. Uh, if you can enjoy an export boost, you get a, a GDP growth, the leakages go up, including imports uh, f- through the multiplier process, and uh, the growth has to stop when exports, when the, the leakages catch up, the import leakages catch up with the injection of the imports, uh, exports. Uh, And, and if the government tried to dishonour that constraint and uh, push the econ- domestic economy harder by spending more than its endogenous tax revenue, then it would create a balance of trade imbalance, a deficit, through the import effect via the same multiply process. And that that would then lead to currency instability and uh, all the rest of it. Now, Caldor was writing in the 50s and the 60s and in during the fixed exchange rate system. And what you'll end up understanding, I hope, is that most of this stuff is fixed exchange rate logic. So here's an equation just to give you a, a, an idea. This is the top is uh, 
is just to in um, levels. PDT is the uh, domestic price of export revenue. So it's how much income flows in in domestic dollars or whatever the currency we're talking about. PF is the foreign price. And so that's how much is going out in imports, M. And the imports obviously is calibrated by the nominal exchange rate. And, and, and they then convert that into growth. These are just growth rates. And from that, I can put several lines of algebra and end up with Thurwell's law. And, and uh, pi here is uh, the income elasticity of the demand for imports. And uh, Thurwell, Thurwell claimed that Marshall Lerner conditions were just satisfied. So, uh, this Y is the balance of payments constrained growth rate, GDP growth rate, and X is the growth rate of exports. So, it's as simple as that. And the solution to that constraint is that for a nation, is that it's only got two solutions. It can reduce, I'll go back here, it can reduce pi or it can increase x, little x. In other words, it can stimulate growth or it can somehow reduce pi. Now, a lot of the development literature that I, I was, I studied a lot of development economics in my younger days, a lot of the development literature um, from the Keynesian perspective in, in the 60s that, that, that was current when I became a student in the 70s uh, was about import substitution growth strategies. But by the 1970s, it, it had been, uh, the, with the rise of the IMF as sort of uh, the neoliberal ruler of poor nations, uh, import substitution was rejected as being, you know, planning and um, manipulation of markets and picking winners and all this stuff. And, uh, and uh, Thurwell's law was reinterpreted in terms of sort of, you know, export-led growth. Now, what are the binding mechanisms that uh, they believe reinforce that or substantiate that law? Well, here's two quotes. This is from John McCombie. Uh, I hope you can see that. The rationale behind the law is that no country can grow faster than its balance of payments equilibrium rate for very long. Note that he, he's really talking about balance of trade, not balance of payments. As its level of overseas debt to GDP ratio will grow to levels that will precipitate a collapse in international conference, downgrading of its international credit rating, sovereign debt and currency crisis. Now, John... John used to talk to us early in a project. He he's a, was he, I think he's retired now. He was at Cambridge University, post Keynesian colleague of uh, uh, author colleague of Thurwell. And here's a more a, a different way of saying the same thing by Mark Setterfield. Fundamental preface of balance of payments constrained growth theory is that we must observe trade balance either because countries are unable to run trade deficits, that is, they can't, they can't uh, attract any capital, or they're unwilling to run chronic trade deficits. And note then, he, the, further down here, he's talk, they're talking more about the same, him and McCombie are talking about the same things, foreign indebtedness, currency crisis, now, the, the, you know, when I read this literature as a young man, having grown up in a, here in Australia, I just sort of thought it was, was hysterical, I must admit. The idea that you can't run a, a, a trade, trade imbalance for very long. And I sort of looked at the data and, and, you know, Australia's run a current account deficit for 
50 years continuously, sometimes up around 4% of GDP. And we don't, we don't have currency crisis. We have fluctuations in our exchange rate driven by terms of trade uh, in commodity markets. See, and Thurwell's law assumed, A, that the balance of trade is more or less always has to be in balance. Relative prices uh, are, are, in other words, terms of trade are constant and you get no capital inflow. Now, a capital importing country like Australia relies on capital inflow. Some of it good, some of it bad. And it's too, too much these days is speculative rather than productive. But the idea that you constrained, that the balance of trade will ultimately come and constrain your growth was just nonsensical. And the, the, people ask me in, when I'm talking in seminars, you know, well, how has Australia been able to do that along with other countries? And the answer lies, and, you know, there's been a, there's a heap of research on the richness of institutions. The, the you know, why do people, why do people uh, take risks and invest in productive capital in Australia, foreigners, that is? Well, because they know there's contractual certainty. They know that we have stable governments. We know that we, we're not uh, likely to spend that money on statues of our leaders. And things like that, these inst fundamental institutions that seem that are completely left out of a sort of simple equation like Thurwell's law really dominate investment flows and decision making. And so as a very, you know, very wealthy, stable democracy, so-called, and that's in inverted commas, uh, Australia can keep attracting foreign capital forever and therefore it can run a trade deficit forever without ever reaching the domestic constraints that Thurwell's law indicates. And ultimately, when you think about that, then the only thing left of this balance of payments constrained growth theory is a, politically un a political unwillingness to do anything that might disturb in any slight way the foreign exchange markets. It's a political constraint. It's not a, a fundamental constraint. All right, a couple of minutes I'll go. Um, I've talked about stop, grow, growth. And so when you've got a flexible exchange rate, there is really no balance of payments constrained growth in the way that Thur will imagine. The exchange rate will adjust to imbalances and the capital account will, will offset current account imbalances. Now, there are implications of all of that, of course. Uh, one, of the, one of the modern versions of uh, Thurwell's approach is through the uh, inflationary effects of any depreciations. So they say, OK, OK, we've got flexible exchange rates now. We understand that. But that means that the exchange rate, may, the, the currency traders will sell off your if they don't like what you're doing and your deficits are too, fiscal deficits are too big, they'll sell your currency off and you'll get uh, imported price inflation and that'll be, go out of control and the sky will fall in. Now, the evidence is uh, pretty substantial and this relies on all sorts of things like pass-through effects and, and uh, weightings in, uh, in indexes and all of that. But... The evidence is that the, the robust evidence is that, uh, that there's, there's not a significant relationship between trajectories of domestic inflation rates and uh, current, uh, currency trajectories. Yeah, you get some price impulses. Uh, there's no evidence that uh, fixed exchange rates have made a country more vulnerable to imported price inflation. The, the other argument is about, well, <coughs> excuse me, just have a drink of water. Uh, 
The other argument is, oh, well, you're living behind your, beyond your means if you're running a trade deficit. And that, uh, you know, well, those arguments, if you've read them, they're just sort of moral arguments. Because with, within MMT, the goal is not production, but it's consumption. Uh, in, the IMF seems to think that the goal of a nation is to produce stuff to export. Whereas in MMT, we understand that the goal uh, is to consume rather than produce. And so if we can persuade a, the rest of the world, a nation can persuade the rest of the world to import, send us more stuff, real stuff, than we have to send them, uh, in other words, to allow us to enjoy a very positive real terms of trade, well, then we're better off. And, of course, that runs con counter to the idea that current accounts are a deficit, that are, are a problem that governments need to uh, manage. Well, MMT economists don't think that at all. And that's, that's a, a really fundamental difference between us and post-Keynesians, in my view. Um, now, the, other, the last point I'll make is that uh, how is it that, that a nation like Australia can run a terms of trade in our favour almost continuously? Well, the answer is that foreigners want to get Australian dollars. And uh, so then the, then the issue is, well, are there dangers in that? And the, and the answer is, well, there, there are dangers in that. Uh, they're not constraints, they're dangers, political dangers. And what, so what can they do with these uh, surplus Australian dollars? What does China do with its surplus American dollars that it's derived because you import more from, America imports more from China than it exports to the US? That than, than it exports to China. Well, they've got various options. One is that they can buy, say in the Australian case, Australian dollar assets. Now, is that inevitable? Well, no, that's a political choice of governments. We have foreign investment review guide, uh, constraints imposed upon foreigners. You can't buy, a foreigner can't buy an established house in Australia, for example. And, a, and a, a democratically elected government can impose whatever rules it likes on foreigners in terms of what it can do in, in the sovereign border. So it could be that a government says you can't spend your Australian dollars at all. Uh, so the only other option then is to liquidate in the foreign exchange markets. And of course, if you've got a country like Germany or China that runs quite substantial, or Japan for that matter, runs substantial trade or Netherlands trade surpluses, building up lots of claims in foreign currencies, and they then decide that they're going to liquidate all those claims, well, they'll just incur capital losses immediately because of the effect on the exchange rate, they're, because they've so, so got such large stores. So it's quite unlikely that you're going to get these type of effects that the post-Keynesians believe, and the evidence doesn't support it anyway. Uh, the, the other question, and, and I, I'll, I'm going to leave a few minutes now for, for um, questions. Uh, I, I, I could talk about capital controls. They went out of vogue, but uh, Iceland has taught us very clearly do, during GFC how a small nation can take on the global financial markets and win. Using, using their sovereign democratic legislative capacity and capital controls. And on deindustrialization, that's a separate topic really. That, this is this idea that you, you hollow out your domestic manufacturing sector and rely on domestic, uh, foreign imports. And so you become more vulnerable and, and you end up sort of with workers just delivering hamburgers or pizzas on scooters as, as your employment base. Now, there is, there is validity to, we, we should be concerned with, with uh, a hollowing out of quality of employment, but that's in the hands of the, of the current issue and government as well. There's no inevitability that you, that you have to hollow out your, your um, industrial sector. 
And of course, the, the development economists of the 50s and 60s were all about import substitution and building up that capacity using planning techniques and fiscal support. And so that's a separate topic. And the other, the other topic that I, that I haven't got time to in an hour is the idea of poor nations who are import uh, dependent upon imported energy and food. Now, they really are, they are really in a stuck position. Uh, and as I've said in other, other seminars, and the last time I was at Levy, actually, uh, that a poor nation can always maintain full employment of its available resources, but that mightn't make it very, very well off at all if it doesn't have very many available resources. And so it does have problems that, where it has to uh, somehow persuade the rest of the world to either buy its exports or provide the resources in other ways. And as, I've, as if you're a regular reader of my work, you'll know that I believe that's a role for an international multilateral agency. And uh, that would be what I would create as I sack the World Bank and the IMF. Okay, so look, I'll, you know, they're all very, I could spend hours talking about each of those topics. So I hope that gives you a feel for, for what all this is about. This is a major area of difference, in my view, between MMT economists and post-Keynesian economists, and I really believe that the post-Keynesians have led us, the non-mainstream side, down by buying into all of this stuff. So I'm happy to sit here as long as you like, given that it's the day is about to break, uh, and answer any questions that you have. And thanks very much again to Dimitri and Randy for inviting me. And I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Hi, Bill. I have a very basic question for you, and that is, can you can you explain why people want to hold another country's currency? And the two things that come to mind are they want to leverage it for more financial profit and they want to potentially buy stuff in the future. Is, is there more to it than that? Well, I think there's multiple reasons. I mean, uh, certain currencies uh, have attractiveness because they, these so-called carry currencies where, where, where they're safer than other currencies. So the Australian dollar, for example, historically has been a carry currency where financial investors will carry it because it's safe and they can use it then to do cross-currency trades and uh, therefore pursue speculative profits. But, you know, I mean, it, the, the, the other reason uh, and a fundamental reason is that uh, uh, countries want, uh, believe that they, they can uh, build up their capacities by investing in other nations. And, uh, and remitting the, remitting the uh, pr nominal returns back. And so they can't do that unless they are willing to hold, uh, acquire the domestic currency that, you know, and the only way they can get hold of Australian dollars is by exporting more to us than we uh, import from, uh, than we export to them. So there's multiple reasons and, uh, uh, relating, you know, ranging from venal, speculative, non-productive financial transactions to, to, to genu genuinely building up productive capacity and diversifying uh, your supply chain and things like that. Hi, Bill. Um, I want to be a bit devil's advocate. You mentioned that uh, poor nations can always maintain full employment of its available resources. And very often I feel that the concern comes in of what happens after the private sector has received that income. Uh, does, it, uh, does it generate demand that then inflicts pressure on the exchange rate, etc., and therefore that might uh, you know, cause unsustainable situations? How, do you, how would you address that? Um, are, are you, and why are you not concerned about this? No, I am concerned about it. I said that this is a really big problem, and uh, uh, but but I couldn't do I couldn't do it justice in two minutes. Uh, that that I needed another hour to talk about that question, and you know I'd refer you to the, and you're very you're very familiar with Fidel. Fidel's done a lot of work on this. I've done a lot of work in developing economies over my career, and and it's a fundamental problem. You've got a country that's uh, 
that's dependent upon food quality and energy uh, on, f- by imp- for imports. And, and it's, uh, what, what's it going to do? Well, it's got to start exporting. And uh, uh, the, the, problem, the, the problem is that, the, uh, and A, the exports mightn't be very attractive. And moreover, the, 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 the shift in development mentality and strategies from the 60s and the 50s to the 70s and onwards has really made it harder for these nations. Because in the 50s and the 60s, the whole strategy was predicated on the fact that, yes, we do have a problem because we're reliant on these, uh, these essential imported commodities, not luxuries, they're just essentials. And so what we'll do is uh, we'll reduce our, so that we can push our economy a little bit faster to provide increased employment domestically uh, and give us the space to do that, without endangering our exchange rate, we'll develop import substitution uh, uh, investments. And that, that, that was a very successful strategy because import substitution strategies provides, provides a space for, for uh, nations to import more capital, uh, uh, productive capital. And, uh, but that was all thrown out in the 70s. The IMF has sort of f- threw that all out and the structural adjustment programs and its export-led strategies, uh, A, turned what was essentially uh, uh, n- not always, but sustainable agriculture, so subsistence agriculture systems where, you know, local gardens, community gardens in poor countries, which, which more or less, depending upon the... Uh, the crop quality would feed the nations. Uh, scrap that and turn, you know, turn the agricultural sector into uh, export cash crops. And uh, as a consequence, the, 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 that, that sector lost its subsistence quality and uh, became dependent then on the vagaries of international food prices. And of course, all the, all the poor nations were pushed to do the same thing. And so food prices drop because there's a flood of food onto the, the international market. And uh, so then they have to get more debt because they can't repay the original debt the IMF slumbered on them. And, you know, they, these strategies have made it even harder. So the, the, I'm not saying for one second that I'm not worried about it. It's a fundamental problem that should should require all of the advanced countries to cooperate to make sure we, we attenuate the problem and make sure that every country in the world has food, has energy th- that's leaning towards renewables and has vaccines and the rest of it. But that's not the way the international community works. And the international community favours hollowing out the state in poor countries uh, making the uh, any its economic fortunes dependent upon world markets that are heavily uh, sensitive to speculative uh, financial gambling. So you know the whole commodity trading speculation is is a disgrace, and so I'm I'm very concerned about it, and it's and it's a fundamental problem that we're yet to address, and uh, uh, we need to address that. Um, can you say a little more about capital controls? Um, one sort of just specifically mechanically, how does how do you impose capital controls? Like what 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 are the operations there, and what what does that mean? And two, do you recommend those sort of to stave off a speculative spice spike in the exchange rate, or something kind of more active than that? Okay, I mean, there's various forms of capital controls, but they all come down to a dictate from the government in question uh, as to what constitutes a legal foreign exchange across its border. Now, when you're talking about Australian dollars, the Australian dollars don't have to be in Australia. They can be in Switzerland or Germany or Red Hook. Uh, 
and there would have been some uh, foreign exchange in Red Hook if I had been here this week, uh, uh, Australian dollars. I'm not sure I've got any anymore in my pocket, but uh, uh, so a capital control is just when the government says, okay, certain foreign exchange transactions are no longer lawful and that any anybody who uh, attempts to engage in those transactions uh, will be prosecuted. Now, obviously, they can't, capital controls, controls can't, um, can't get at uh, black, you know, black market money and money laundering and all of that stuff, but they can certainly stop foreign exchange traders who have to work through clearing houses and, and, and conventions that all nations accept on an international agreement, well, then they, they're, not, they're, they're not going to, uh, if they, they're, they're going to be extremely reluctant breaking the law. The consequences would be too great. Now, the example, I, the, the most current example of how successful these are is Iceland, as I briefly mentioned. And, you know, Iceland had the biggest banking collapse during the, in history in global financial crisis. Uh, Iceland had become the sort of exemplar of this main, neoliberal mania that financial markets can do anything and they don't need any oversight or regulation. And when that system collapsed, the, the overreach of the banks was unbelievable. When that collapsed, the, the, the little Iceland, a little country, was, it was really in danger of total economic collapse. And its president forced the government to overrode legislation where the government was going to uh, enter payback schemes for international uh, speculators. And the president intervened and uh, overrode the intentions of, of the government that was elected at the time, was in power at the time, and imposed capital controls. Now, the two big hedge, American hedge funds were involved in that and they tried to sue the Icelandic government. They tried all sorts of ways in which to get their money out of Icelandic currency back into the currency of their choice and they couldn't do it. They failed. And, and even though in the early days of that crisis, the the Icelandic uh, currency did, did depreciate quite significantly. After a very short time, it started to appreciate. And by 2015, the Central Bank of Iceland was doing everything it could to stop it continuing to appreciate because it was endangering the tourist industry that had really boomed uh, in the immediate aftermath of the global financial crisis. So what's the lesson there? The lesson is that if you're in danger of having your currency disturbed significantly by the gamblers of the foreign exchange markets, then you can do something about that as the legislative power. You can stop that happening. And uh, uh, as long as you float your currency and as long as you can uh, impose capital controls. Now, a lot of people don't understand that capital controls were normal during the fixed exchange rate system. And it's, and it's a reason the fixed exchange rate system was prolonged as long as it would, because it was getting into crises in the 1950s. You know, Bretton Woods came in in 1946. Well, it was in crisis early. And the only reason that countries like Italy and uh, France could uh, remain in that system was through capital controls. And uh, I could talk more about that in the Euro sense because, you know, that once the neo-libs took over Europe and abandoned under the single market agreement the uh, uh, capital controls, you, you, get, you get Black Wednesday in the early 1990s, you know, currency crisis again. So capital, and, and the IMF now even understands that the capital controls are effective, even though that was the anathema to them as they were preaching their neoliberal uh, religion, um, they now understand that capital controls do work, they're effective, they're in the hands of the government, uh, 
and a sensible government can never can never really uh, leave its nation vulnerable to currency collapse. Okay, Bill, we'll take one more quick question. I just wanted to add one thing to the import substitution. You also, of course, can prioritize imports. And on the um, Tony Thurwall, in addition to current account uh, or current account constrained growth, uh, he also had a loanable funds. At one point uh, in uh, Mexico, we were on a panel together, and you're saying, oh, you Americans, you're sucking up the world's savings, and that's why the poor countries yeah. can't develop. Yeah, that's right. Here we have one last question. Uh, okay, also one question and one brief comment. Uh, I, yes, you are right. The post keynesian most of them embrace the uh, tier was low. And uh, I remember uh, several countries in his book uh, with McCombie, and he tests for several countries, it seems more or less that uh, uh, the, the law apply. So have you tested this for Australia yourself? That's my, my first question. Well, my, my question and my, 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 comment, my comment, very quickly. I mean, my, my late uh, Julio, uh, uh, thesis advisor, Julio Lopez, uh, for, well, was the first one to say that the exchange rate also uh, uh, is, is important because uh, that affect the uh, export and imports. The, uh, before he died, he, he told me that uh, that, that the, 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 the law doesn't apply because uh, the other components of the balance, the sectoral balance equation also are important to explain economic growth. So this is what only thing I want to say. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, in my past, I, I have done a lot of econometric work on that. And uh, uh, you don't really have to, uh, and, but let's be careful because if you give me a set of data and you give me a conclusion, then I can always use the most sophisticated econometric techniques to come up with your conclusion, always. And uh, so we're really, you know, and, and what I'm saying is that you can't just rely on all of these regression studies. I can prove Thurwell's law, I can disprove it using econometrics, no problem. I had a few lags here and a few error correction terms and what have you. I test, I test co-integration differently, whatever. How many vectors do I have in my co-integration space, whatever. So just understand that since 1970, Australia has run current account deficits continuously. And we're one of the richest countries in the world. And we don't have currency crises. We have currency fluctuations, but not crises. We don't have out of control inflation emerging from the exchange rate fluctuations. We don't have huge currency sell-offs. The government can always sell however much debt it wants to. The, the, the bid to cover ratio in the, in, in the bond market is always around three to four. If you, I don't need econometrics to tell me <laughs> that the the that that it's just not a constraint. That's a it's a binding constraint. It can be a political constraint, and it obviously is. People, governments that buy into that way of thinking obviously will constrain growth and act as if we're in a fixed exchange rate system. The, the, the other point you made about the other components of the, in other words, domestic expenditure, the, the, the other absurdity is that government spending is, can never be exogenous. In other words, there can really be no I concept of discretionary government spending. It's always going to be driven according to these guys by guys being generic, by the way, uh, by these characters, by the tax revenue driven by export growth. Now, you know, that's just basic violation of common sense of reality that, of course, government spending can exist independent of export growth. It doesn't mean you can you won't create imbalances at need to be managed in different ways depending upon circumstances. But this blanket 
idea that government spending is really part of this endogenous domestic thing driven by ex export uh, demand is just ludicrous. And, and uh, I just I've never believed it, never will. And I think that I think solid economists should reject balance of payments, constrained growth theory. Okay. Is that it, Randy? That's it. Thanks a lot, Bill.